Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on the time you tune into this. I'm your host, Imran Abu Bakr, and welcome to another episode of the Blue Taste Podcast, where I sit down and talk with, you know, incredibly young people, you know, pushing the marker forward, you know, in activism, art, entrepreneurship, uh, you know, content creation, you know, all avenues of life, essentially. So today I'm here with uh, Ade Akeem, uh, a local Houston uh, content creator. You want to introduce yourself further? Uh, hi, I'm Ade Akinbio. Uh, I am on YouTube and soon to be on SoundCloud with music, men, but mainly I'm focusing on, I guess, lifestyle and speaking with others on various topics that will have to that have to do with the younger people today. Today, uh, we have a really uh, interesting topic at hand to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about Gen Z dating culture and just everything that comes along with that. Uh, and we're going to try to make this uh, appealing to as many people as possible. Uh, you know, people that grew up with uh, certain religions, you know, non-religious people, secular people, um, just just a lot of different avenues we can go about this. But the topic at hand is a dating culture for Gen Z, the Gen Z generation, which I believe is from uh, 1995, according to more, most sources, uh, ending with uh, maybe 2015 at, at the latest. Uh, I've heard, I've seen the 2010 uh, number a lot, but um, the general... Um, the general marker is, you know, mid to late nineties to uh, the two thousand the two thousand tens, essentially. So this production uh, is two parts. It's a two party production. Um, we record. We kind of brushed up on a lot of topics on a day's uh, video. You know, check out his YouTube channel. It'll be in the description uh, box below. Uh, but you want to talk about what we just said on there? Uh, yeah, we talked about, I guess, simping as well as some other topics that would have to do with ghosting and how a lot of people, mainly like confidence and how uh, people, they tend to, I don't know how to say it, but they tend to view others as more than themselves. And that also kind of messes with the, the mental psyche of it and so we kind of brushed up on them and yeah so like they said we we brushed up on a lot of topics on this video but uh, we're gonna try to really get into depth uh, on those topics about why uh you know certain societal norms exist why we go about things a particular way why is it acceptable to treat people a particular way um so um let's get started so we've uh, generated various topics of interest uh, the first topic we want to go into, uh, which is ghosting, uh, you want to bring up like the technical definition of that? Yeah. According to Google, ghosting is the practice of ending a personal relationship with someone by suddenly and without explanation, withdrawing from all communication. Essentially, you give this person no closure at all. You right. say, hey, I, I, it's like, you can kind of regard this as a, a selfish act, you know, uh, ghosting. It requires no effort on your part. Right. You know, it's super easy to, uh, you know, delete this person's number, block them for whatever reason. And I, I don't know, man. If uh, the thing is, if you ghost someone because they're, uh, you know, like abusive or something, you know, or like kind of creepy, dangerous, whatever, you kind of get a dangerous vibe from this person. I, you know, just ghosting is definitely justified. Right. You know, you, 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 this, you don't owe this person an explanation at all. What do you think? Like the red flags are there and they're showing. So then it's like giving you permission to ghost them. But I think other than that, ghosting is just a lazy, selfish act because you're not giving and you're not putting any effort into telling the person that, hey, this isn't working out or, hey, I'm not really feeling this. So I'm just going to go and, you know, talk to someone else. So I think that. Ghosting, unless it's in a certain situation where it's the only option. Otherwise, if you like tell them that it's not working and they start like stalking you or something, but yeah, stalkers, yeah, definitely. You know, this person, you know, because it's a problem, you know, and it, and it happens to certain people. It happens, it can happen. That ghosting is definitely justified, but thing is, it's it's a uh, 
what is it's it's just good it's proper etiquette you know right. if you want to end a relationship with somebody uh you know for any reason even if they've wronged you i think it's you don't have to you know you know believe anything i say uh but i just think it's proper etiquette to you know end the rela- relationship you know directly by telling them hey i don't want to associate with you anymore right. and so because the thing is you may not realize it but if you were actually direct with that person it it can uh, help them change it can by saying hey i don't want to associate with you anymore because of this this and this you know some people need that realization right cuz when you give them a reason as to why as to what they did to push you away they have i guess they have a better opportunity to change that thing so that they have a better chance with someone else and so that they'll have the uh, more options and they'll actually be able to choose from those options. So ghosting is depriving them of that opportunity to change themselves, to change whatever it is that they need to change and to improve on themselves as a person and, uh, and I guess do better in the, on the dating scene. And the other thing is, I think a lot of the reason why a lot of ghosting occurs is just too damn easy. It's right. so, it's so, it's not difficult at all. You don't have to go to, the, because some people have a really hard time, you know, expressing things explicitly for whatever reason, either, you know, they didn't grow up doing that, or maybe they have some sort of anxiety at hand where they cannot be, you know, outright with whatever they feel. It's just an easy, convenient option. And sometimes the convenient option isn't the best option. But I don't think people care anymore. Yeah, I don't think people care. I think uh, definitely, if it's definitely through a screen, I think it kind of, just from my experience, I think kind of maybe lessens your ability to be empathetic towards other, what the other person is feeling. Right. Because you're not, essentially, you're not talking to the person, talking to a screen, which is a medium to talk to the person. But if the person was right in front of you, I don't, it's it's harder to do that. It's way harder to do that. But when there's a medium like a screen, a phone, whatever, you know, it's super easy to just you know, ghost. Right. Because with ghosting, through the like through like like you mentioned through the screen, that's a lot easier. Because they can't if you if you ghost them, they can't do much anything about it. Because you've already blocked them. So they're not gonna try and come after you in real life, especially if they don't. Especially if hey, some people, you know, go through the work of making fake accounts and mm-hmm. you know all this other garbage that people, you know, are just really obsessed with you. Uh, you know, cause if you have somebody that's obsessed with you, they will not stop. It's relentless. Okay, well, and, you know. Calling you from different numbers. Hey, and this does, uh, it can happen to guys, but this happens to ladies way more often, you know? Yeah. Um, ladies, be careful out there. Be careful. And the worst part is that they're actually going through all that work just to get in contact with one That's person. That's the thing. People who are obsessed, they don't see it as work. They don't. It's just this, uh, uh, they just see the goal at hand. I want to interact with this person. I'm going to go, because if you, if you really like something, mm-hmm. you know, you don't necessarily care about how you're going to get there. You just want to get there. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to really, you know, view, you know, um, all, you know, this effort is it's tedious. You're just going to do it because you want to talk to this person so bad, you know? That's just is really crazy. I mean, so that's uh that's our take on ghosting. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, the talking phase uh, now. Man, so the talking phase, man, the talking phase, I personally, I really dislike this stage, man. I, I don't even really think it exists. Yeah. So, I mean, so from what you've been able to like research, like what exactly is the talking stage? When two people basically flirt and start feeling each other and they are just slowly getting into a relationship. So that's a definition we pulled up from Urban Dictionary. Um, when basically... Uh, like what, like you said something like really pivotal about what it actually is. Like it's basically dating minus the actual going out. Right. It's you know for a guy this is honestly this is almost heaven because you don't have to put in the money to actually you know take a route. You don't have to you know 
you know, you don't have to drive her anywhere. You know, you can just slowly have her develop feelings for you just by sending her snaps or texting or text. I mean, it's, I don't know. I feel like, personally, I feel like this is not what grown people do. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a grown thing, man. This yeah. is, I think this stemmed from like, I think this stemmed from like middle school culture. Middle school. Actually, that would make sense. In middle school, you when know, you couldn't, you couldn't really do anything. So, what did you have to resort to? Like uh, when you didn't uh, see them at school, you had to resort to just talking. You, you, it may in your uh, in your view, it may have been uh, considered may have been considered dating, but you're just talking. I don't know. Like, what do you think? I think that now that we're actually adults, like uh, like you mentioned in the video. We can actually drive around. So talking isn't just talking is for when you're like, when you, when your phone is the only, your only medium of communication with them. So with dating, you would actually have to like be driving around and going on an actual date. Are we, are we stuck in those like old habits of like just talking? Because even and even if you know you do have the means of taking her out, you know you do have you know you're blessed to be able to have a car, means of transportation. You have money. You can uh, you know actually do things. Um, like man, it's it's good to not have to put in the effort. You know, instead of you know just do this. Man. I think people are just they since they become so accustomed to that, they're starting to get lazier and lazier with. Uh, gestures of, I guess, love or maybe even infatuation. And that's probably what's given them the, uh, the, the, the push to just, you know, stay in the quote unquote talking phase. Yo, there are people, like, especially with relationships that resort, like, you know, that happen online, like people, you know, that, you know, never, spoke on the phone, never like FaceTimed or anything, just messaged each other. And then like, you know, and then they say that they're in love, man. It's crazy. And there's a thin line between love and infatuation. You know, and I guess because people don't necessarily get out as much as they used to, love the word love has become a word that is just thrown around. That is true. That is, that, that's something I definitely can uh, see. Also, like you said, um, you know, our generation doesn't really go out as much. We think we do. We think we do. But, you know, there's many, uh, many, uh, there's uh, been many polls. Uh, many polls have been done. Like, we, we're not as outgoing as previous generations. We're not out doing as many. We're not, we're not, you know, playing hooky as much. You know what I'm saying? Right. We're not. I don't know, for some reason, we just like the comforts of the indoors. And that's what, in my opinion, that's what's making us as a generation softer. Really? Hot take, hot take. Because <laughs> back then, I used to go out a lot. And yeah, I'd get like skid marks and everything, but that built me up to be tougher. You know I mean, we you, when we were kids, we became tougher. But now that we have the comfort of the indoors, everything is indoor. So it's not giving us much reason to go out and explore because everything is just given to us. And so that's really taking away, taking us away even from social skills, which will, which would affect our dating life. Yeah, man. I know, I know, I, it's not a bad thing to be awkward, but, um, you know, there are many awkward people that are very successful in communicating their ideas still. Because, you know, communication is a learned skill. You know, you're not born a great communicator. That's why people go to school for it. I mean, that's why communication is, is a major. Right. You know, people become the best communicators that they can be. But, man, I've seen it, bro. Like, people my age, they don't, just don't know how to talk to people. It, and it's not even about, you know, not even courting girls. Like, talking to girls is one thing. It's just talking to other adults in general. It just, it, they don't. People, they don't, they're, they're not, you, they don't give them the proper eye contact, you know, and they don't give them, you know, the respect they deserve, their attention, you know, when they're being spoken to. It's, it's crazy, man. And this is, when you, so when you want to get good at something, you have to practice it, right? And with us not going outside, 
we don't practice communicating to other people. And I think that plays a big part in the lack of communication in a lot of relationships today. You're right, right. Because people don't, they didn't learn, they didn't grow up learning how to properly communicate their feelings. So when they're in a relationship with someone, they expect that someone to be like the other people who actually sort of knew what they were feeling because they knew them better. They grew up with them. When that's why nowadays a lot of girls, when they're angry or uh, mad or frustrated about something, they'll expect their significant other to just know, right, to know what it is that they're angry about. Instead of communicating and telling them, hey, what you did at so-and-so was kind of offensive to me, and I think we should really talk it out. It's just, oh, you know what you did. You should know why I'm angry. And right. It's very because the thing is, you have to realize that that person probably doesn't even know they did something wrong. Right. It may, maybe it's something, because especially when it comes down to, you know, because uh, nowadays we're dating people from all types of cultures. And it's something that someone does, you know, they're just some, accustomed to doing a particular thing. You know, you may find it offensive, but that's just who they are. You, you Are you really going to get angry at them for just being themselves? But if it's something that really, if it's something that really just bothers you, you should communicate it. And thing is, I've uh, come to find find that you know, parents who practiced, you know, conflict resolution in front of their kids, those kids ended up being like great communicators, man. Right. Like parent, but in, but parents who like never talked about things in front of their kids or constantly fought in front of their kids, uh, like that's, that's what you get. That's what you're raising your kid to believe communication is. Right. And that really, that, that sticks with the child through the childhood. And even in adulthood, and it may take years and years, well within their uh, adulthood, maybe in their middle ages, before they figure out that what they saw from their parents isn't what is actually right. And I think that should be changed. Like We should normalize communication, both between equals and maybe with someone younger or, or definitely someone older than you. Just It shouldn't be just awkward silence the whole way. And I think we should take, I feel like um, PC culture has to do with a lot of this. Um, People are afraid to voice their opinions for fear of being, you know, uh, for their views being stigmatized or, you know, them calling people, people are scared these days of others calling them out. You know, it's a real thing. You know, you don't want to offend anyone. So, but thing is, you're not offending anybody if you're just upfront with your views on particular things, or you like things a particular way. You can, if you communicate them, you can compromise on those things. Right. Like, not everyone is just going to assume, hey, this guy's opinion is offensive to me. There's probably going to be someone who agrees with you, or someone who disagrees, but they can, you can find common ground as to what you're disagreeing about. It's not all just everybody. Everybody who disagrees is against me. And the thing is, with talking stage, I feel like if you if you're constantly putting effort into making your text message conversations really, really interesting, you're not really giving yourself room to have like amazing conversations in person. Right. You know, because I've I've it's heard it's a common complaint. Oh yeah, I was texting them. Yeah, they were so live, but when I met them in person, they were so dry. Like you've heard that before, right? Yeah. And actually, I myself am kind of guilty of that too. Like, I would always overthink the conversation I'm having on the phone. I never, I wouldn't realize that the conversation in person was supposed to be more interesting than the phone. As it should be. Right. Because it's not like they're, you're not trying to portray your whole personality through the phone. You're supposed to do it in person so that they know who it is they're actually talking to and they'll have a little more of a better feel of like what it is that's cool, of why they are and who they are on the phone. Right. So the thing is, even if you're in a talking stage, which I personally don't even agree with, um, it doesn't be, it will never actually be hanging out with a person. Never. Right. Or going on a date with a person. Because even that is his own thing. Versus, you know, hanging out or calling it a date. It's a, it's a thing, man. And there is actually a difference between hanging out and going on a date. To go on a date, that's when you would call it dating. Right. Yeah. You're specific with your intentions. If you say to a girl, hey, can I take you on a date? You're 
giving off the energy that you are interested in a relationship. Right. And but saying, hey, you want to hang out, it doesn't specify what it is that you want. It more so tells her that, oh, this guy probably just wants to have sex with me or something. Maybe, maybe that. I think people hang out just to get a feel for a person. Right. Just to, you know, they don't essentially want to be too intentional. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just want to get the feel for a person. The main, it can, if you're hanging out, it can, you know, uh, translate to a date later down the line. But people are like, hey, I'd rather hang out with you first, see what it's like to be around you. You know what I mean? In a very casual way, without the expectation, oh, we're on a date. I have to, I have to, you know, show her all my good qualities. I have to be this, I have to be that, because I want to be with her. So we're on a date. Um, but yeah, hanging out, it's, it's way more casual. So like less pressure. It's less pressure, exactly. I think with hanging out, it should be more so, if you want to like get a feel for her, I think it would be better if you hang out with like a group of people with her in it. So you can not only get a feel for her about or like how she acts in general, but how she treats other people. I think you should do both too. I think you should uh, hang out without the pressure of a date, you know, just together, and uh, you know how uh, she is with around other people. Because if you're uh, if you constantly is hanging out with ar- around other people, you're not really uh, you know getting her comfortable with being with you alone as well. True. True. So then, what would be I think that the difference more so in regards to like going to places between a date and hanging out, I would think that a date would be more so like maybe a movie date or a dinner date, but with hanging out, it would be more so like a walk to the mall or walk in the mall, really. That's what hanging out is? I would think so. I've actually never done that. Really? Uh, yeah, I've, you know, I'm not really like a, if I want to hang out, I just I just call up the bros man like yo right. let, let's go let's chop it up, but hanging I don't know man it's just not appealing to me. So you've never actually hung out with a girl in a casual way like that? Mm-hmm. Nah, actually no, I have, mm-hmm. I have. I just don't do it often. For me, if I if I if I like a girl, I I like I just like a girl and be direct and intentional about it because that's just how I grew up. You know, that's what you know, that's, that's what I've seen my father do. You know, he he liked the girl. He didn't he didn't play around. I mean, uh, that's the thing. My dad married my mom within three months. He saw her. He liked what he saw. Went up to her, approached her, and be like, "Who should I talk to about this? Your dad, your brother? Who?" She oh. said. She said, "Hey, my my dad is uh, my father's out of the country. You need to talk to my uh, my brothers." And my grandfather, my dad went to my uh, my great grandfather and my my uncles and said, "Hey, I, I like your sister. I like your granddaughter. Uh, you know, I'm I want to be intentional about this. I want to I want her to be my wife." And that's how he did it. Wow. That's how he. That's because that's just that's the culture there. Mm-hmm. That's just how it is. You don't you don't like necessarily hang out with a girl. True. You know what I mean? True. I think that would be a more I guess sort of romantic and i use that term loosely the romantic way of doing things because mm. it shows that you're willing to go through her family to show them for a uh, sh- to show her and them that you actually have true feelings for the girl and a lot of nowadays girls like they have they either have a lot of brothers or they'll have brothers who know a lot of people so you have to go through them before you get to the girl it's like uh have you ever seen the movie Scott Pilgrim vs. the World? I've heard of it. I have watched so it. So basically, he wants this one girl, another girl likes him, but she's irrelevant. He wants this one girl, and he has to go through her seven evil exes. And so he has to go through seven people of, uh, to prove that he is in love with her. So I guess sort of like test trials. And that's kind of how it is nowadays. That people have to go through her, guys will have to go through her friends, oftentimes maybe even her family, just to get to her instead of, uh, as opposed to, you know, just like, hey, I like you, you know, let me, uh, maybe we can meet the family when we're in a relationship. Mm. So it's like, instead of meeting her brother, uh, instead of being introduced to her brother when they're already dating, it's 
you have to go through her brother in order to date her. Thing is, I that I feel like that uh, was a thing, you know, with uh, with older people. I don't think that's really a thing now because uh, you know, certain like societal norms are changing. Marriage rates are going down like a lot. You know, younger people don't necessarily want to get married because maybe they saw their parents weren't as happy, or they want. They, a lot of people see marriage as being like tied down. You know, they see it as a negative thing. Like once you're married, like you can't escape. Thing is, marriage is not something you want to escape from. It's something that you want that if you are married, if it does, this doesn't apply to you if you actually don't want to get married. But if you are considering marriage, it's something that you should want to, you should gravitate towards and, you know, try to, you know, put, acquire, put in the most resources you can in order to build something up. Because mm-hmm. marriage in its truest form, uh, purest form isn't necessarily about love. It's about family building, building people got married to, to, uh, increase, uh, um, you know, their influence uh, to build their empires. That's what people got married for. It wasn't necessarily romantic. It was sure, like a legacy. Legacy thing. I need an heir, right. you know? So I'm going to marry a girl that I think is worthy to carry that bloodline. And so, and we're going to, and I'm going to establish something with her. And uh, we're going to increase our family as well. Because it's, once you're married, now your families are bonded forever. Right. But then with that, what about... Sort of like the concept of baby daddies and baby mamas. Baby daddies and baby mamas. I I am really interested in uh, how it started, but uh, from what from what I can understand, uh, so not to get too political about it, um, but you know this trend of, um, of I I don't want to I don't want to say illegitimate children. Um, I can I think it's kind of offensive, um, but. You know, single parent households. That's what we're going to, uh, gonna, single parent households. It, it maybe it, you can regard it as a cultural thing or something that is, um, seen in, you know, um, you know, uh, poor communities. Um, but what do you think about it? I think that it more so has to do with a lot of one night stands. And how people think of the other person. So, like, sometimes maybe the the female will think that the guy who impregnated her doesn't have the quality, the right qualities to be a father to the child. But then it can go the other way where the guy doesn't think that she's fit to be uh, someone that he can actually, like, care about. Another thing is a lot of men you know ha- just haven't been taught uh to uh you know take that next step in terms of being responsible for another human being's life because you, if you if you want to teach a, a boy to be a father you need to start really young and show him you know uh show him how to treat a woman how to treat your children you know when you get to that age but a lot of guys you know in, they're stuck in you know you know stuck in adolescence essentially you know, they don't see, you know, kids as being a huge investment, huge um, a period of your life in terms of developing them and developing who you are as a person. Uh, but, yeah, man, baby, single parent households, uh, it's a big thing. Uh, but that's a topic uh, for another episode. We can go really in depth uh, about that topic, uh, why it's a thing, how it originated. Well, as far as I know, it's always been a thing since, you know, the beginning of time essentially or you know the beginning of human existence uh, but yeah that's that's a topic for another episode so now we're going to transition into uh dtr or defining the relationship um thing is for me it's it's a little strange because i you know my parents are immigrants so i kind of inherited you know very simple mindset about relationships either you are in one or you're not and there's no there's it's not very nuanced you know there's not all these you know complexities of you know are we in a uh, all these other terms of situationships friends with benefits like that's not a thing in my culture and that's not that was not a thing that was mentioned in my household you know my dad said my parents said you know if you if you're in a relationship you're married or whatever very serious relationship or you're not in one you know what do you think 
Uh, I think that I actually agree with that. You know, there shouldn't be all this extra stuff like being uh, friends with benefits or F buddies or none of that. I think it should just be straightforward. Like either you're together or you're not. And I've, no- I've noticed that a lot of people, they claim other people, even though they're not in a relationship. Mm. You know, it's like, oh, he's my man's who's not my man's. You know, it's like, I understand the concept of speaking things into existence, but it's wrong to claim someone and stop them from getting someone else who could potentially make them happy. You know, and then with defining the relationship, that that shouldn't be a thing. You know, it should just automatically be, oh, yeah, we're together. We're dating. We are. We're a thing. We're locked up. Oh, that's my bae. That's my boo. Shouldn't be. Oh, it's complicated. There shouldn't be a complicated option. Thing is, um, for me, I'm I'm not necessarily saying it shouldn't or should be a thing. I'm uh, necessarily uh, just bringing up the existence of the like of, of the matter. It's a it's a fact. It's a thing. Something that people exercise in our generation, and some something I see a lot of older people are now starting to uh, you know start doing, but. Uh, for me, I, I don't want a virtue signal and say, "Hey, you know, you want to, you should, you should be monogamous. You should do this and that." Because there's some people, a lot of people with like very successful polyamorous relationships, which is very. That's another label I want to bring up. Uh, polyamory, <laughs> essentially, you know, hey, multiple partners. Like, yeah, I've always actually kind of been been interested in like, I guess, kind of delving into that idea. Really? On your, yeah. Like you personally? Yeah, me personally, because I think that a, polyamor- a polyamorous relationship could possibly be fun, you know, but at the same time, it could definitely be stressful because one person could feel like they're the, another is getting more love than they, and a lot of jealousy would play out into it. From, a, from what I've seen, a lot of polyamorous relationships... Like the person in question has like a main person, like a main relationship, and then they're they're like allowed to have you know like a lot of flings, but they come back to one person that they're you know committed to. Oh, um, that would be an open relationship. Open relationship. It's I think it could go both ways, uh, but yeah, open relationship I think is a more common term for it. Yeah, because with polyamorous, out as far as I know, polyamorous would be one person would have multiple partners. That they would tr- attempt to like treat equally or what? Because mm-hmm. I remember I saw this one um, video of a woman who was actually married to four guys. I saw that. I, I saw that. I, yeah. yeah. That was, that was, that was pretty interesting. Um, and then she, uh, she ended up, uh, you know, having, you know, a kid with uh, one of them. And other guys got kind of jealous, and there was a there was a huge case about that. Uh, one of the guys ended up abusing the, the child. Right. I, I I know that video you're talking about. It was really crazy, you know, because I like, I believe that video is on Vice or something. Yeah, I think it's on Vice, and it's really I think that's more of like a cultural difference too, because back uh, where I'm from, I'm from Nigeria, and back then. Uh, down there, uh, the Muslims, and I, yeah, I, I believe it was the Muslims. There apparently uh, they were apparently allowed to have several wives. That, yeah, and, polygamy. Yeah, yeah, polygamy. And uh, even my mom, her dad, yeah, my grandpa had two wives. So I have like cousins from my uh, from my mom's my mom's mother's side, and cousins from my other grandmother's side. If that makes sense. Uh, just a quick history lesson on uh, polygamy, you know, in the Muslim world. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, these Muslim guys are allowed to have multiple wives. Uh, why? Why should they, you know, uh, have, all, you know, these extra rights? The thing is, at the time, you know, uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, with Islamic crusaders, you know, a lot of men were dying in war, uh, uh, Islamic war, you know, uh faith wars jihad you know and a lot of men were dying and leaving all these unwed women and so there were very relatively uh re- there's a relatively small amount of men in the in society and you have a, like a, 
like all these women uh, outnumbering the, the men, either five to one, seven to one, whatever. And so it was put into place uh, in order to get these all these extra women married uh, because uh for whatever uh, and for whatever reason, they saw that a lot of unwed women that are at the marrying age, uh, you know, that's detrimental to society if we have all these unwed women just roaming around. So, you know, we want to uh, give the men permission to marry multiple wives in order to, you know, lessen that amount of unwed women of marrying age. So that's just a quick history lesson. If you want, I can, you know, go into the history of uh, you know, any religion, Islam, I'm kind of specialized in that growing up a Muslim. But yeah, but like you said, defining the relationship, uh, you know, polyamory, it's a it's a slippery slope. It's a slippery slope. But let's talk about let's talk about this cuffing season on uh, uh, oh. a promiscuous season thing. Right. And so apparently with cuffing season, there are different stages to it. There's the scouting. So, like looking for a partner, uh, seeing who would be interesting. There's the drafting, like choosing who you want to start talking to or whatever. There's the tryouts, you know, giving a, uh, feeling out, give, feeling out for the person and trying to see if they're, they'd be the right fit. Preseason, getting a little bit more serious with like, uh, a smaller amount of people. So I guess the people who are, who have more of the, more of a chance to be chosen by you. And then there's the actual cuffing season, choosing the best person and, uh, exclusively dating them for the holidays, which I think is just kind of, I think that that'll be just out of, uh, loneliness because the holidays is more of like when that, uh, feeling of loneliness is big. A big thing. So people are essentially just going through this process of, you know, doing all this trial and error and, you know, eventually selecting somebody just so they're not lonely in this particular time of the year. Yeah, pretty much. Wow, that's interesting, man. So what about this promiscuous season? Like, you know, I don't want to use the actual term for it, <laughs> but like, uh, you know, when people, you know, during the summer months, you know, when there's warmer weather out, people are out and about, um, and people, you know, tend to, um, of course, I'm generalizing that this is not applicable to everyone, mm. but people are more comfortable, you know, having multiple flings and whatnot. Yes, yeah, summer and spring flings. And I think that, yeah, yeah, like that's pretty much the complete opposite of cuffing season. But I feel like cuffing season, since it's around the colder months, that's really why everyone you know, they want someone to feel, uh, to keep them warmer. You know, like you said earlier, they want them someone to keep them air, uh, warmer. When but you're then, shacked up inside, you know, snowing outside, you know, shacked up with that person, that significant other. Drink some hot cocoa and some marshmallows over the fire. You know? <laughs> right. But then now that it's summer and it's already warm, you know, you don't need to get warmth from somebody else. And so it's just like everyone's more free to go out and, I guess enjoy the promiscu prom uh, promiscuity. If that's the word. You know that that that's definitely the word, man. Yeah, uh, it, it's and it's an entire song about it, right? It is. Uh, what is this? Oh, promiscuous uh, girl, I think. I, I I was gonna mention hot girl summer. That, oh, hot that, girl. Oh, yes. That yes. thing. Uh, maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm not getting the concept. I don't know. Uh, really, I'm not really familiar with hot girl summer. Or what that entails, but I mean, as far as I know, with all the posts from all the uh, all the Instagram and even some Snapchat posts and Twitter, I think we we're, we're that's definitely in the ballpark. Okay, okay. So with that in mind, this is a topic you know that I was excited to talk about. I mean, this is the premier topic of this episode. We're gonna talk about simping, why it's a thing. How, like, the psychology of a, of a man in general, like, women do, uh, tend to simp as well. But just the psychology of, of someone that simps for another human being, uh, man, this is, is crazy. And I'm not gonna judge anyone, um, you know, uh, like, I'm not, I'm just gonna bring it up, uh, bring up my point of view and, uh, just what, what society thinks about it in general as well. Right. And simping is, is, it's a very big topic, but at the same time, it's 
sort of it's not as broad as one would think it is. Right. It's more simply it's like there there are specific things that you would know that you would see a quote unquote simp do. And you don't necessarily see it as much with women, but like I think with women you see it more on social media right than you do in person. Because you would never see, you, you would rarely see a woman go all out and buy a whole bunch of balloons and like a five pound teddy bear for a guy that she wants that's not already hers. Right, right. Um, like yeah, like you said, um, you know, guys, you know, will because I mean, we're we're just society deemed us or human or just like the human dynamic between male and female. Um, we're deemed the provider. We have to provide something. You don't necessarily have to provide, you know, any sense of stability right now, but our subconsciously, we want to provide something. So you're going to, so guys, you know, go all out. Hey, let me do your assignments. Let me do whatever I can. Cause they want to provide value to you in order to justify it for you being with them. Right. Like for, so I guess to go for validation, they want to be, they, they want to be validated. Like they want to, they want someone to know that they exist. And because that person knows that they exist, they want to look to that person because they can't get the validation from somewhere else. I think that plays a big part into the psyche of the person who is something. And uh, I think we should just generalize it right now. If we like just generalize it to mainly guys, because that's the, main thing i mean also that's i mean that's our your expert expertise we have expert expertise on it just from being a guy right i mean um thing is i mean men are not guys are not taught how to talk to girls you know like it, and the thing is you're not supposed to be taught how to talk to people you're supposed, supposed to just you're supposed to go out and talk to people and find mm-hmm. out what works for you you know a lot of uh, uh, guys are said, hey, even if even if she's not your uh, girl, you know, you have to do this, this, and this. And, you know, th- this advice comes from women. It comes from other guys. It can come from parents. Um, you know, you have to do this X, X, and X in order for you to court her. And that's the thing is, I'm, I don't want to go into uh, the specifics if, if she's deserving of, you know, that kind of love and attention because that really depends on the person you're dealing with but i don't think that's the best method of going about things right it's like you gotta when when taking advice from anybody do what works for you because being because some people like let's say be confident that's a word of advice that that just about anybody would tell you but for some people they don't really need confidence because they already look like the ideal guy that a girl would want so it may not work for them. I mean, it could work for you, but just pick and choose. I would say it's best to pick and choose what advice works for everybody. And uh, a common uh, sentiment that I've been observing on social media uh, these days are guys, uh, you know, saying that it got uh, girls would want an asshole over a nice guy. The thing is, if you if you want to, de- let's define nice guy really quickly. So uh, according to the internet definition uh, or the uh, cultural implications of a nice guy, a, g- a nice guy is someone that, you know, panders to, uh, you know, panders to women. They think that if they do all these nice things, you know, you know uh, for a girl, that a girl's going to suddenly realize that uh, he's the guy for them. And the thing is, you're not being nice for the sake of being nice. You're being nice because you think you can get something out of it. You know, and that's that's not a, that's not a thing. Like, I don't care if you're an, uh, if you're a nice guy. You should be a good man. You know right. what I mean? Right. That's just a part of being a man. Like, don't disrespect anybody. But to be nice to try and get something out of someone, that's just gonna leave you with nothing. And it's not that she like like you mentioned in the video. It's not that she necessarily likes that chooses the asshole over the nice guy. It's the it's that the asshole has more confidence than the nice guy. Or uh, there's also a thing about masculinity. Um, girls, uh, you know, there's that, that feminine energy and that masculine energy, you know, it complements each other. If you're not displaying that masculine energy, um, that 
you know, um, asshole guy might display. I mean, you, are you necessarily going to, you know, uh, be enticing to her? Because if you're a nice guy, you, you're, you're just, uh, you know, uh, the nice guy. I'm not talking about being a nice guy in general. I'm talking about the cultural implication, the definition of a nice guy. You know, you're just throwing your masculinity out the window. You're just going to say whatever she wants to, you, you're going to say whatever you think she wants to hear. You know, you're just going to pander to her every decision and you're going to justify her actions, even though like, you know, she's not a, even if she's not a good person, you're going to try to see her in this heavenly lights because you want her so bad for whatever reason either sex or you know you want the validation of being with a girl and you want to be you want to you want that title of a stud but the thing is you know masculine you know a uh, energy you know someone being of intent being masculine i'm not talking about you know you know displaying all these uh traits of you know, cojones and like, you know, gruffing, you know, and grunting and all these things. I'm not talking about that. Masculine, uh, I mean, in terms of, you know, being the provider, you know, showing, you know, giving a back seat, uh, to the people you love because you want to see the people you love, uh, prosper. That's what it is. You want to provide value to people. But if you're trying to provide value in a very superficial way, I mean, why you think she's actually gonna like you? Like, of course not. Right. It was just like you trying to try to try to do all these things just to get her to like you, like these big gestures, you know, spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars just to try and impress her. I mean, it's not it's not even to like get her to like you for the money. It's to get trying to get her to like you for you, but you haven't shown her who you are. You know how uncomfortable that can be for girls sometimes? Like uh, a, a girl that's only talked to him for like maybe on three se uh, three separate occasions. And then, you know, when let's say prom comes around and he has this huge, you know, promposal. Like it's really uncomfortable. Right. And it's like she can't say no because it's in a public setting. I mean, there are some girls who are bold enough to be like no and just shut him down right then and there. But no... Girls nowadays, they don't want to be the type of person to publicly say no to such a large gesture. For fear of being seen as mean or something. Right. Because the social, the social constructs have deemed her to be like, like she cares. She's going to care what other people think about her. She's going to care what her friends think about her. And people are going to think so negatively of her if she just says no to such a huge gesture. From a guy that she's only talked to on three separate occasions. That brings a, another good point. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, in a bit after we finish with this segment. Um, you know, like the pressure uh, there that you there that pressure from other from your friends on who you should date. Um, you know, there's a you know because it happens. You know, uh, you know, a girl likes somebody, but they're not necessarily appealing to her friends oh he's too this, he's too that, and then I don't know. Uh, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, we could bring that up later on. But there's like, yes, there's that pressure of not trying to be seen as mean because nobody, nobody wants to be put in the scene in a bad light. Right. And you, you realize that they might do that for a specific purpose. The guy might do that for a reason. So she doesn't, if he gets that validation from everybody around him. Yeah, bro. She said, yeah, good job, whatever. But it also implies that he knows it's hard for her to say no. Mm. So that nice guy isn't a nice guy. I would think that that's more like a psychological thing, right? Kind of messing with her, messing with her a little bit psychologically, but also forcing to get, forcing himself to get a win out of the whole situation, right? So it's like a for him, it's a win-win. If you were really about it, man, you pull her aside in private and you ask. That's how. That's how I would do it at least. Because right, with that. Girls do like big gestures. Just if she's actually with you, right, right, right. So it would be, it would definitely be a totally different case if guy had already been with girl. But if guys only talk to girl three separate occasions, then guys just being a douche, <laughs> <laughs> like straight up, <laughs> and guys just being a horrible person. And forcing her into saying yes. Now, that doesn't stop girl from uh, in privately telling him, like, hey, I don't want to go through with this. 
Right. Like, I mean, I mean, I think that's the main argument girls say is why they'd rather have the asshole over the nice guy because at least the asshole's upfront about what he wants. You know, I I'd rather him, you know, be slightly a dick or be a or be a full on dick. I I rather than have this nice guy, you know, who's you know he's not clear with his intentions. He's kind of slimy. Uh, you know, he he tries to put off uh, put on this image of being uh, this really virtuous person. But in reality, he probably wants sex just as much as any other guy. You know, so I I can I get this. I understand the argument. I don't necessarily agree with it because um, I don't know why you deal with you tolerate an asshole anyway. Like right. I, I'd, I'd rather I personally I'd rather be alone than be with someone that's abusive. Right, and I think that with uh, choosing the uh, with like choosing someone who's more upfront, in my experiences, even if the guy just wants sex. The girl will still gravitate towards the guy who told her straight up that he's just talking to her for sex than from the guy who's trying to fake a relationship just to get sex. Right. You know what I mean? Because at least you did something respectable by telling her. So even if you're not successful in getting what you want, she has a good level of respect for you because you were willing to be more upfront with it from the start. I mean, if if that is your type of thing, I mean, at least let her know, you know, uh, the implications of this relationship. Hey, if this is, you know, purely sexual, I mean, let her know that. Don't put off, you know, the, uh, don't put this uh, idea in her mind that you want something more than that uh, just because you, you need to get your needs met. I mean, that's just my take on it. Um, but a lot of the time, the uh, thing is, people who like, People who uh, gravitate towards abusive partners, um, I could be I could be wrong, and I am generalizing. But a lot of the time, you know, they grew up in abusive households as well, and that's how that's what that's the love language that they've been showed. That's right. how you love someone. If the person's not fighting with you constantly and then making up, and then you then you're then you're happy that you made up, and then you fight again. If you're taught that a relationship should be this like really dramatic thing you know unless he doesn't love if he doesn't yell at you or you know he doesn't get passionate about or he doesn't have you like i've seen this on social media Mm -hmm. especially uh you know on whatever on whatever platform uh girls are showing uh uh, girls will be showing this thing on their stories where a guy's kind of being rough with a girl or like he's telling her off or something and the caption's like if a guy doesn't do me like this i don't then i don't want him i'm like yo this like, or if he's not rough with me like this, I don't want him. And I'm just like, this is crazy. It's like, love shouldn't be abuse. Well, it shouldn't be like making up after abuse. It, like, honestly, I, sorry, I don't think that with, uh, like, the, I guess it ties into fetishes. Really? Yeah, because. You ever notice that back in the day, you didn't see as much about people liking being choked during sex and all that. But then nowadays, it's like, oh, if he doesn't choke me or if he doesn't push me up against a wall and yell in my face, and it's like, oh, I don't want it. Like, apparently things like that are, it can be a big turnoff for me. Uh, like I said, you know, that there's that... uh there's this, this is very real, that masculine and feminine dynamic, that dominant submissive dynamic, right. you know, masculine people tend to be more dominant, feminine people tend to be more submissive. And I guess that that plays a huge part in that. Yeah. But the idea that you should that, I mean, if it's your thing, I mean, go ahead. But I'm talking about besides the sexual aspect, just all aspects of the relationship, you know, if spiritually, you know, uh, physically other than sex if you're emotionally abusive that's i'm sorry to say that i i don't think that's love and it but you know some people grew up with this idea they've seen parents their mom or their father put up with this and they're like hey i mean because guess who are your first teachers in this world right your parents that like that ties into a huge part of what we as people see is love Cause what we, we don't learn, 
like like you mentioned, they're our first teachers. So what we see through them is what we portray, and it, that's what we think we know. And so it's not like, and, and TV does play a big part in it, but you don't necessarily learn the proper way to love someone from a TV show because it's just purely entertainment. It's all fake. You know, your parents, you see that real, you see that right up close and in front of you. So I think that parents, our parents have a big, uh, a big part. They play a big part as to how uh, we view love. Also, um, I think uh, there's definitely religious aspects to it. Um, you know, some, uh, religions, you know, just like very specific doctrines that are written, you know, that, you know, uh, will teach you how to treat your spouse. You know, your spouse needs to be treated in this particular way. I know some, I know some religions, you know, explicitly give permission, you know, for a wife, uh, for whatever, you know, to be given, you know, physical punishment, um, for, I, I guess, you know, disobeying you. Uh, as a man, and it's just, I don't know, man, Re- religion is, religion it plays a huge, huge role in a lot of things, in religion, and, re- and dating in general, which we're going to transition to, so there are a lot of, you know, uh, you know uh, socially approved ways of dating, uh, regardless of what religion you belong to, um, so there's the, also always that idea that you find that virtuous person, you know, in the place of worship, you know, church, mosque, that's that's where you find these, uh, you know, virtuous people in the eyes of God. And also religion is very inherently cultural as well. Um, there are just some, there are some religions that are very popular among uh, uh, many cultures and they go about dating or courting, not even, the, they don't even have dating in their vocabulary. Court, that it's, you court uh, for the purpose of, uh, you know, being in a relationship and they have their own preconceived ideas about how to go about that. Yeah, so like in a lot of African cultures, the in order to court, you would have to, I guess, go about bringing various things to show that you are worthy of being with that person. For instance, in some African cultures, the male is supposed to bring like goats or, uh, I mean, not even in just African cultures, in some other uh, non-American cultures. They're supposed to bring like things like maybe a goat or some cattle or some type of animal to prove their wealth, and then some uh, some foods. Not even to the, not even to the uh, bride, but to the bride's family to just show that they're that they're not even just worth being with the with the bride, but that they have enough riches and other stuff like that to support her. And to uh, and to support her family as well. It's a very very similar thing in the Islamic world. Oh, there is this thing called mehr, uh, essentially where you pay a sum of money uh, to the family or to her um, in order to marry the girl. And it it doesn't necessarily have to be money. It can be gold. It can be livestock. It can be a house. Uh, but it has to be something of value. Um, but I. Uh, in order to court the girl. So a lot of the younger, uh, you know, Muslim people are just very religious people. Um, you know, it came from, you know, religious families. Uh, basically, if you are not seen as someone that can provide value to someone else uh, in terms of marriage at the moment, you're not even expected to interact with the other sex at all. Um, I know uh, just from my experience, you know, uh, you know, just hearing, you know, sheikhs talk about it, you know, if you're not going in with the intention of marriage, you shouldn't even be speaking to the other sex uh, on that level. And if uh, we're going specifically by Islamic doctrine, uh, we shouldn't even be friends necessarily uh, because it can lead to other things. And of course, there's uh, this idea of temptation, um, you know, being being tempted by the opposite sex, you know, uh, you know, especially when you're alone and things of that nature. Um, so we can go uh, very in depth about religion and how it affects uh, the, the basically how it affects uh, or, you know, you can view it as being clashing with a lot of progressive Western ideals. Um, I don't want to I don't want to uh, regard, you know, religion as regressive. Um, 
but it's definitely a topic for another episode. Um, so that's a pretty much our take on religion at the moment. Um, this is also really a topic uh, to bring up. We're going to talk about hookup culture. Um, sex nowadays is super easy. It's re- readily available for those that really want it. Like, you really want it that bad. Sex is not that hard to come across. Um, I, I mean, sex with no strings attached, at least. It's not that hard to come across. I mean, you're aided by the, you know, by the apps, by, you know, all various apps that, you know, I don't necessarily have to name, but there's so many ways of even social media platforms have become ways of, you know, hooking up with other people. Um, Yeah, man, hookup culture, it's, you know, some people, a lot of conservative uh, people, people with more conservative ideals, you know, regard it as a detriment to society. I don't, I wouldn't go so far as to label it that, but it's definitely, it's definitely an interesting thing. And I think it also has to do with, um, you know, it plays a part in the declining marriage rates in younger people as well. Yeah, because with, with hookups, it's like, I would think that hook up, hooking up is just, but there aren't, aren't there like certain levels to hugging up? Right. You don't, I mean, some people don't go all the way, but if you went in with the intention of getting off, I yeah. think, you know, it counts as a hookup, regardless if you did or not. Right. And this is, it's just like, and it's gone as far as some people willing to pay for a hookup. And that. I mean, I mean, I feel like this is just prostitution has been happening for, since forever. Right. True, true. And we're possibly, you know what, we'll get into that probably another time. But with hooking up, that's just, I think that ties into, uh, uh, I guess commitment issues. You know what I mean? And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But with hooking up, that doesn't, people don't. Are we going to so are we saying that there's a specific type of person that is non-committal in nature that likes to participate in hookup culture yes. rather than the opposite? Rather, because from my from from what I would understand it to be, I would think that if you're in a if you're in a system that you know gets your needs met, it changes your view, it changes your perspective, and it it, it might entice you to not be as com, uh, committed to uh, you know, not, not, you know, just, uh, it might not encourage you to commit further on, but rather you're implying that there's a certain type of person that doesn't like to commit in general that, you know, tends to participate in hookup culture. Right. Cause once you've been interested, I mean, in, introduced to the easier route, you're not going to want to take the longer or harder route that it would take in order to, like you said before, in order to court someone or in order to date someone or anything. You just, you found that it's easier to hook up and you found the, when you did, like I said, you've been introduced to that easier route. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm saying. That's what I meant by, uh, commitment issues being a byproduct of hookup culture. Uh, hookup culture is the thing. And then once you've, you've participated in many times, it changes you and makes you, maybe hinders your ability to, be able to commit to someone because now, I mean, for some people, they just need to get their physical needs met. And they're good. They don't need to emotionally commit to someone uh, in that type of way. All right, and I think that ties a little bit into mental stimulation. You know what I mean? Because you've already gotten, you've gotten your physical needs met, but intellectually, you're still looking. And I think that also ties into uh, cheating. But I guess we uh maybe we'll get into that later. But uh people they don't they tend to gravitate more towards the hookup culture because dating it's 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 definitely a lot harder, you know, to date and to try and impress someone or get them to go out with you than it is to find someone who's just looking for a quick for a quick hookup. Back in the day um, before uh, the existence of social media or the internet in general, people tended to date those who were just around them. You know, people who were, you know, in close proximity to you, and that's who you ended up settling down with. But then, 
you know, the rise of social media, you know, the invention of the internet. Now we're introduced to so many people. And then it, it it's like we're like a spoiled kid, you know, and I'm not the first person to say this. You start to you start to get overwhelmed by choice. And, you know, you want to try all the flavors, you know. Ah, oh, I see this person. I like the way she looks. Uh, uh, but I, I like the way this person looks also. And it, I don't know, it kind of changes your perspective. I, if you're overwhelmed by choice, you, it, why would you be committed in a sense? Because you, I mean, if you, because if you can have as much sex as possible, like that, let's be real, most guys or anyone, women, they would take that option. Right. Was, huh. People, they, they tend to, like I said before, they grav- gravitate towards that. And it's like, why would you choose to go through the talking phase like we've mentioned before and the uh, risk of simping, like we've also mentioned, when you have a, a perfect opportunity to go out and, you know, just do any any woman that has that's giving you the right attention. I think I think yeah, man. I think I and I think most people would. I mean, um, if you look at it this way, I mean, uh, an average like any guy, you know, a very attractive uh, woman, you know, uh, offers the idea of sex. I mean, most guys, um, most guys would you know happily take that on. I mean, we got men in general. We love sex, or we, you know, there's a a biological desire to spread your seed, you know, as far as possible. Um, far and wide. Right. I mean, that's just how it is. I mean, there's this subconscious desire um, to, uh, you know, you know, pass down your your genetics. Uh, to be quite honest, I feel like, you know, the de- the dating topics, uh, you know, in Gen Z culture, I feel like it can equate to in, an entire series. I really don't think that um, you know, the length of this episode uh, really justifies the amount of content that, you know, we could really create with this, uh, you know, with this topic, um, because it is extremely complicated and it does entail a lot of things that we might be ignoring. Um, but we got, we do need you guys' insight, uh, later on in order, because, uh, like I said, uh, th- these are just our views on the topic at hand. Um, how our, from our personal experiences, um, the way we were brought up, because uh, we are, you know, African guys, you know, grew up in African households. Right. And so with uh, the topic of Gen Z dating culture, it's a really broad topic. So I'm sure there was stuff that we uh, we still need to uh, kind of cover. But I think that with, since, like, like you said, these are our views. So I think it'd be uh, nice to respond to and see what everybody else thinks of all this. And this is with uh with Gen Z, Gen, Gen Z, we are a complicated generation, to say the least. For sure. And with all these terms of of uh that we've mentioned, you know, like sin, talking phases and all of that, I don't think these terms occurred during in our in the past generations. And so it's they, really they, they might have they might have occurred, but they were not they were not given labels probably. Mm, true, true. So it's kind of interesting. I guess maybe uh, it's kind of interesting of like the history of how these terms came to be, right? You know, and so it's, it was definitely interesting to kind of dive into this. So with that in mind, uh, that's going to be our send off. Um, we really do need your insight. Uh, check out a day's channel. Uh, it will be in the, uh, all the descriptions of um, you know when when this video is uh, when this uh, episode is released. Um, you should really check him out. Your local Houston content creator um, talking about all sorts of things. And but, doing music, and he's a music producer. He also does music as well. With that being said, that concludes this episode. We'll see you next week. And bye.